to start by saying I have an irrational love for two institutions. One of them is Parliament, especially the Westminster Parliament, for what it could be. <laughs> and the other is SOAS. And I love SOAS because it has everything I really adore. It has masses of politics. It has people, really exciting people from all over the world. And it has connections to parts of the world that I love dearly, including Africa, Asia, and um, Latin America. And our director, Baroness Amos, symbolizes all that, partly because of the work she's done, which you probably know about, so you probably don't need to be reminded, but of course, she is a British politician, she was Secretary of State for International Development, she was UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, and she's known across the world. So she embodies SOAS, and who could be more appropriate to launch our new global research network on parliaments and people than Valerie Amos, who I welcome up here to make some remarks. Um, I gather this isn't, that one isn't working, so I might as well move it out of the way. Um, Emma, thank you very much. I always think of, of Parliament as a bit sort of quirky, eccentric and weird, so I'm slightly taken aback that you think that's what I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> and even more weirdly that you think that SOAS is like that, but I, I, I absolutely take the point that you make um, about both of them being um, very in, uh, interesting institutions. So. Um, a huge thank you to Emma and also to Ruth. Ruth, where are you? Have you run away? Oh, um, and to Ruth, uh, because the partnership with the um, Hansard Society uh, in terms of today's conference is really uh, important. And I'm very pleased uh, to be here to try to uh, bring together the elements of why this work is important um, for SOAS and why it's important um, for Parliament. So I'm going to say a few words, as uh, Emma mentioned, uh, because I think it is important that we formally launch the Global Research Network for Parliaments uh, and People. Uh, and then there'll be an opportunity, um, I found out to my horror, for a Q&A with me. I thought I was going to be on a panel. So keep the questions easy, please. <laughs> um, and there will be a panel after uh, this session at quarter to three. Yeah, um, thank you. So just a few words about the project, which is designed to create opportunities for scholars in politically fragile states to undertake research on democracy, public engagement, and women's political participation. And the aim is to link researchers and arts organizations interested in deepening democracy by supporting their research and advocacy of uh, those uh, three themes, representation, exclusion, and reimagining uh, politics. And I'm very sorry that I wasn't here uh, this morning because I gather that there were some great uh, presentations uh, from Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and uh, Myanmar. Now, it's work which, as I said at the beginning, very much resonates with the approach that we take at SOAS. We really pride ourselves on taking alternative uh, perspectives, on being a school that is uh, rich in the history, the heritage, uh, the scholarship of the regions in which we specialize, but in ensuring that those, uh, perce uh, those perspectives are very much at the forefront of our thinking. So we like to think that we are turning the world uh, upside down, that we are challenging conventional uh, orthodoxy, uh, that we are really at the heart of the decolonization agenda in the way that we work, and that we do that through our understanding of distinct and diverse uh, languages and the cultures uh, of the societies in which uh, we work and study, and where the collaborations and partnerships that we have in those countries are absolutely uh, crucial. We are very, very aware that without innovative partnerships, we can't work 
uh, with colleagues to make political institutions more accountable, or indeed figure out what more meaningful engagement between political leaders and society might look like. And that's a question, I think, not just for uh, politically fragile societies, but increasingly for mature democracies as well. The Arts and Humanities Research Council is supporting the network, uh, encouraging those uh, partnerships across social sciences, arts and humanities disciplines, but also between scholars and creative industries. And here in the UK, we are very, very conscious of the importance of this. And the AHRC has really been leading the way in terms of trying to create that space to enable that uh, engagement across social sciences, arts, and humanities. Because much of the conversation about deepening the engagement on research in the UK has been around uh, science uh, and engineering. And uh, what we have been seeking to say is that innovation has to include social sciences, arts, uh, and humanities in its thinking. I've spent a lot of time in my political career directly involved uh, in aspects of British political life. So I have first-hand experience of what I think is the importance of representative uh, democracy and the challenge of staying true to your values given the compromises required, particularly uh, when one is uh, in government. Um, it's a bit more straightforward, I think, uh, in uh, opposition, but it's not necessarily uh, easy. And there have been many recent uh, challenges in the United Kingdom, uh, in uh, other countries across the European Union, in the United States and uh, elsewhere, in terms of the role of conventional political parties. Uh, especially as we have seen the rise of uh, social media, different forms of uh, communication, and the way that they have been used either to attack or defend parliamentary democracy. The more, most uh, important recent example in the United Kingdom, of course, is around the debate uh, that we had in advance of the referendum uh, with respect to leaving uh, the European Union. But the aspects of the debate uh, that became a critical part of the engagement uh, of the British public uh, around uh, that issue has spiraled into a whole host of separate issues that people uh, care about. At the top of that uh, agenda, the issue of uh, migration, uh, rights uh, of uh, refugees, the issue of free movement, for example, but also associated uh, issues to do with uh, human rights, uh, the role of uh, the European Court, uh, the role of Parliament, a whole host of issues that have sparked uh, debates, uh, which I think are essential uh, to our understanding of our democracy, but also uh, critical to our engagement uh, with democratic institutions uh, going forward. Uh, and it's, it's a hugely contested space in the United Kingdom at the moment. Um, there are issues around you know, Parliament versus uh, the people, uh, perceptions of that, uh, around the role of uh, the media. Uh, we had uh, one newspaper famously calling uh, our judges the enemies of the people uh, when uh, they uh, voted that uh, Parliament needed to have a say uh, with respect uh, to Britain leaving the European Union. Uh, there are issues around the role of the House of Lords and the fact that the House of Lords is not uh, elected, and the balance that exists in our democracy between Parliament, uh, the Executive, uh, and the Supreme Court. And we've had some really critical conversations, I think, in the last few years. I mean, they have really become more intense uh, in the last few months, seeking to explain what is happening in Western uh, democracies, particularly in Europe and the United States. And there's a common theme that runs across them all, that right across the political, social, class, and race spectrum in the West, 
citizens have lost faith, trust, and belief in our democratic institutions. Now, I think that the seeds of that were planted a long time ago, but that it was the 2008 global financial crash that turned this into an existential crisis for social democracy in the West. Why do I think that? I think that because the mainstream political, business, and academic uh, establishment collectively, in my view, bought into a fallacy, believed that boom and bust was beaten forever, and that the case for a post-Cold uh, War, liberal, social, democratic, globalized, free market consensus had been won. So those of you who are really working to establish these democratic processes in your countries, please learn the lessons from the things that we uh, took for granted. We assumed that because there was a kind of feeling that uh, there was a centrist, um, uh, and centrist in the sense of uh, center-left and center-right uh, view of the world uh, that had been bought into by the countries which um, were seen as uh, victorious after uh, the Second World War, that this had been consolidated through national and international institutions. And uh, it wasn't true. Um, and that uh, that consensus uh, delivered the things that citizens were looking for. So, for example, um, uh, a lessening of uh, poverty uh, across uh, the world, for example. <coughs> but what sufficient attention wasn't paid to was the ways in which uh, societies that became uh, more plural, uh, more diverse, uh, also began to engage in challenges around uh, national identity, for example. That issue of national identity and who we are, um, for example, in relation to uh, the United Kingdom, I, I think has become very, very prevalent. And that notion of Britishness and who we are, I think, um, has been at the center of our uh, debate, uh, not just around Brexit, but also around how we see ourselves as a nation uh, going forward. So there are some key lessons to learn, I think, about some of, from some of the mistakes that we have made uh, in terms of what we have taken for granted in the way that our democracy has uh, developed. I think we forgot that politics is ultimately about individuals, families, and communities. Uh, we took the public for granted. We told people about the benefits of globalization and didn't prepare them for or help to mitigate the risks. So as societies develop, the political institutions, the parliaments, the politicians, the civil society uh, organizations need to help people to understand that change. And not just to understand the change in a positive way, but to face up to the challenges that those uh, changes uh, bring. Today, we're facing an unprecedented set of global challenges, threats, and unsolved crises. I think across the world, we're struggling to make sense of conflict, mass migration, refugee flows, inequality, uh, environmental degradation, climate change, threats to civil liberties, uh, religious fundamentalism. I mean, the list goes on and on. And the, in the midst of all of this, the changes that we are seeing uh, politically in terms of, um, I think, the growth of uh, different sorts of democratic processes in countries uh, which are fragile and where it's really important to consolidate those changes, but also challenges to those democratic processes in more uh, mature democracies is something that both sides need uh, to learn from. And I'm particularly concerned about the way that there is now uh, a, a kind of oppositionist view emerging about um, facts, uh, fake news, um, who engages in the debate and how, and how we take on board uh, the challenges and the issues that uh, people care about. 
If we learn anything from the major political shakeups that we've seen uh, recently, I think that there is one very important thing that we have to learn, which is the importance of seeing what the world looks like from a perspective that is unlike our own. There have been endless analyses of the reasons behind the election, for example, of President Trump, the breakthrough of the far right in Europe, uh, the vote, uh, as I've mentioned already, to leave the European Union. What is crucial, I think, about all of those is that they highlight the major fissions um, and differences which exist in societies and which have been, uh, uh, as it were, highlighted by these changes rather than uh, managed uh, through strong leadership. So there are big questions, I think, which have been raised about how do we therefore ensure that everyone has uh, a voice? How can we bring those debates and discussions into uh, parliament, parliamentary discussions and also into the discussions and debates uh, that governments have? Now, a key part of the decolonization uh, uh, agenda, um, and including at SOAS, has been around how we decolonize our curriculum. But added to that, I think, is the importance of looking at how we decolonize uh, research. How do we ensure that we put in place and work within a partnership and collaborative framework that ensures that national uh, scholars have the uh, resources, uh, have the capacity to engage on an equal footing with uh, researchers uh, from the West. This network is all about achieving that. I'm extremely proud that SOAS is a key part of that. For us, that part of turning the world upside down is about ensuring that the power uh, with respect to um, research, uh, analysis, in-depth scholarship and understanding actually rests with the scholars from those countries themselves. And that through that cross-fertilization uh, from those scholars, uh, with scholars from, for example, the United Kingdom, that we can have a richer uh, and more nuanced understanding of the challenges that we face uh, in terms of securing democracy. So thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted that we've been able to uh, launch the network uh, today, and I look forward to engaging in a Q&A with all of you. Thank you very much. And Emma's promised if we run out of things that she's gonna ask questions. So please. The floor is open. No, there's someone at the back. And if you don't mind saying who you are. Um, hello, I'm Pooja. I'm an independent researcher. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Baroness Amos, for that uh, very clear and eloquent uh, uh, talk. Um, I have a question in regards to SOAS's stance on decolonization. And I mean this with the utmost of respect for yourself and parliament and, and SOAS. I was wondering to what extent um, SOAS's campaign to decolonize academia has led to somewhat of a <clears throat> demonization of Britishness and really um, British uh, nationalism and pride in, in British history. And, and really whether we need to re-educate um, society as to what the dangers um, of globalization are and provide a better understanding of that given that Britain has always been a global empire and um, both of us wouldn't be here without it. Um, I think there are two different. I think there are two different points there, um, which is about decolonization in British history, and then a, a, a different point, which is around uh, globalization. No, I don't think that the 
um, that the SOAS campaign actually demonizes uh, British history at all. Um, so I think, so the, the decolonization campaign is something which um, SOAS students have campaigned on um, for a long time. Uh, we now have a joint agenda between our students and, um, our, uh, and the school um, in terms of a vision, in terms of decolonization and what we're seeking to do as a school. And we think that um, we have a long way to go despite the fact that we are at the forefront of this. And the media have, um, well, certain parts of the media have sought to, you know, um, uh, make fun of this in the sense of, you know, screaming headlines that said, you know, we no longer wanted, if you were doing philosophy, to look at Kant and so on and so forth. I mean, which is completely nonsensical. Um, what we're saying is that, you know, the reservoir of um, uh, engagement and scholarship and knowledge doesn't just rest uh, with scholars who have worked um, historically in the West, that actually that there is a reservoir of scholarship across the world which we need to uh, tap into. Um, linked to that, uh, I think that there is an issue about how we properly interpret British history and what um, it means. So, you know, I grew up in the country, uh, Guyana in South America, which was a British colony, became uh, independent in uh, 1966. Um, if, you, if you spoke to my parents, um, they are uh, no longer with us, but they grew up learning about British history. They didn't, learn up, uh, they didn't grow up learning anything about, uh, you know, Africa, um, the slave trade, uh, what, what that meant. Um, uh, it was about Britain. They learned about Britain. They knew more about Britain than they knew about um, uh, any other uh, place in the world. So I do think that there is something about, you know, th those of us who have grown up through uh, those periods of colonialism, post-empire in our countries, and what that means for the way that we understand the world. And that, so there is, there is something that we have to challenge there, which relates to the broader agenda of decolonizing our minds. Which brings me to um, uh, your third point about uh, re-educating society um, on the dangers of globalization. I think it's about, um, it's about the challenges of globalization that, you know, I think for a long time, the way politically we talked about globalization was purely in terms of uh, its benefits. And we didn't talk sufficiently about the challenges. And if you look at the way, and you know, I come back to being parochial for a moment, about the impact that ha that has had on parts of the United Kingdom, the big divide that we see between um, as it were, London and uh, the rest of uh, the country, um, it's huge parts of the country where, which no longer has uh, uh, industry or uh, employment. Um, yes, you do have to help people to understand the, the impact that it's going to have. And politically, you have to find a way of giving people hope. That's not a task for SAS, that's a task for the society as a whole. And particularly, it's a leadership role that our politicians have to play. I think everybody's in that post-lunch, had too much sandwiches mood. Shall, shall I do something which people always do to politicians and ask you from the opposite direction? Are we going far enough um, are, are, it, with the decolonizing, particularly of research, which I suppose is my, my passion, because... I, I, no, I think we're still at a very early stage. I mean, you know, we're taking baby steps, which everybody lords as if, you know, we've taken you know, a giant step for mankind. Um, I think that, uh, I think this network is crucial. Um, I think that, you know, the engagement that, um, you know, SOAS and other universities, the scholars here want to have across uh, national boundaries, across regional boundaries is really, really important. I don't think we can take our eye off the ball for a second. Um, I think it's very important that um, we demonstrate the huge success of these partnerships. But we're going to have to continue to push for money. I think we will have to work very hard to make sure that 
Um, our colleagues um, from the Global South, for example, um, are seen as you know, principal researchers on uh, major collaborative projects. Um, no, I don't think that we have yet gone far enough. And I think, you know, I'd like to hear from all of you. Do you, do you think we've gone far enough? Oh, please speak to me. Do you think we've gone far enough? Yes or no? No? Um, could you say a bit more about why? A mic is coming to you while you think. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think quite fundamentally, because we're, we're, we're still always asking, even when we're asking for the voices of uh, local researchers, we're asking for them to put that voice into the special box that we call research, <laughs> which we create, you know, which is not necessarily the same thing. And I, which actually leads me to what I wanted to ask you as well, because um, you know, you've given a very good description of, of, of the crisis in our democracy here. Um, looking at this particular project of SOAS um, and, and Hansard and um, uh, you know, providing opportunities for uh, local researchers to understand you know, uh, the participatory democracy in uh, two countries with incredible challenges, actually, <laughs> in terms of that. Uh, there is, you know, uh, we are in a, it, it does seem like we are at a sort of big kind of paradigm shift or whatever you want to call it in terms of political participation and models and, you know, globalization, uh, understandings of globalization. And yet, those countries um, that we're talking about, and I'm sure Ethiopia will be the same as it is for Myanmar, are actually being pushed into an understanding of a modern country, which is, you know, eight, well, at least in the 1980s or possibly the 1990s. I mean, you know, 20 years out of date, because those are the models that are still being pushed, that neoliberal, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, WTO dominated, which creates the, the very inequalities that are causing, you know, chaos in, in advanced, very, very long-seated democracies. So, I mean, it would be very interesting to just consider how this particular project could, uh, you, know, you know, might have as a sort of you know, a kind of overall goal or overall understanding, some way of uh, creating a kind of equal conversation between those challenges, the challenges that we face as an advanced, as, an, as a longer standing democracy, and challenges of, um, well, certainly in Myanmar, what is um, p potentially, possibly, but may not be an emerging uh, democracy. So I'd say three things, and um, it doesn't just relate to the project, because I think, I think we have to, to recognise that there are things that the project can, uh, uh, can deliver and that there are wider things that we have to work you know, across societies and across international organisations to uh, deliver. So the first thing I would say is that um, there's been far too much um, uh, emphasis, in my view, on a kind of narrow view of uh, democracy as being about elections, as opposed to being about you know, a whole set of institutions uh, that need to be um, uh, nurtured, created, nurtured, um, uh, uh, grown in a country. So you know, rule of law is important, uh, freedom of participation is important, the ability to have civil society organization. I mean, a whole, a whole range of, uh, of things are crucial. So it's not, about, not just about elections. And I think it's very important to push back um, against that very narrow uh, perception of that. Um, the second thing in terms of models being, um, uh, being out of date, there's an opportunity here to, as it were, leapfrog um, to, you know, to look at the, um, uh, the mistakes uh, which have been made in the past, to recognise that, that some of that is about context and, and place. I do think uh, the world is different now and in some ways more challenging uh, because of what we are um, seeing with you know, the turning inwards in various parts of the world. But at the same time, we are more connected than ever before, and there is a greater understanding of our interconnectedness uh, than, ever, uh, than ever before. So I think uh, there's something uh, to build on um, there. 
And then the third thing I would say is, you know, the opportunities for the creation of um, not just partnerships and collaborations, but um, the opportunity to work across um, different sorts of organizations in uh, different kinds of countries to push for change at the global level, I think that opportunity um, exists today and uh, we need to, to build on that. So on the one hand, um, we need to uh, protect multilateralism in my view, but we have to push for a different kind of multilateralism. Um, we have institutions that are way out of date. Um, and don't actually reflect uh, the way the world is now. And one of the things that concerns me about the current deb debate is that it's turning into talking about more and more about the sovereignty of individual nations rather than looking at the interconnectedness and importance of uh, multilateralism in supporting uh, the development of democracy in different parts of the world. We have time for one more, yes. But I can't see anyone burning to ask me a question. You've made me think rather than speak. That's fine. As long as people haven't gone to sleep. Um, I was wondering what you thought about the fact that, that um, billionaires and corporations have also jumped over and Yes, um, uh, I think to a certain extent that's true. Um, and it becomes about accountability, um, I think. And there are two aspects, that, well, there are lots of aspects to it, but there are two aspects that I would, um, uh, I would point to. So your point about you know, billionaires and others speaking directly to people, um, it's not just that. It's also they are having an influence across the world, um, and some view this as positive and some... Uh, view it as not so positive, in terms of how they're choosing to, to spend their money philanthropically. Um, and the amount that you know, individuals are spending through their foundations is bigger than the uh, you know, GDP of, of, of some uh, individual countries. So there's an influence on the broader development uh, debate uh, that we need to be um, aware of. But I think that the second element of it, and in a way, the bit that is crucially linked to this issue of political participation, uh, democracy, greater engagement and everything else is about accountability. And how do you create accountability mechanisms moving forward um, you know, as you have this direct uh, engagement because you know, President Trump will say that he's accountable to the people who voted for him and that he is, he is um, speaking to them directly through Twitter. That's what he would say. Um, and to a certain extent, he is. So it's a, huge, it's a huge challenge. And, you know, I think the whole decline in uh, the membership of uh, traditional political parties is just one element of that. So it's really forcing a rethink. But the fact that it's forcing a rethink in countries like ours offers an opportunity, I think, in countries... Uh, uh, that are, you know, m that are fragile in terms of their political processes to think about this differently. And I think the big question uh, uh, in mature democracies that we're confronting is how do you turn social activism, which is something, how do you turn social activism into a political movement into uh, something that is much more a structured political process? Um, we're very far behind, I think, in our thinking of that. And I think that countries can leapfrog us um, in the way that they think about it. Emma? Could I thank you very, much? Yes, very you can, much. but thank you. Yeah. Thank you I've for really your work. It's a huge difference to have um, 
support at the very top of um, SOAS for um, this decolonizing research as a shorthand, um, but for supporting national scholars, which is something which has become really, really important in the whole of SOAS, though it's not just this yeah. project. Um, but Thank you also for reminding us of the unbelievable complexity of the political environment we're dealing with, because yeah. that's good for us. And could we show our appreciation, please? Thank you.